Hello and welcome to the Saturday Sleep Breakdown for the College Football Championship Games. I'm your host, Matthew Motto for Lamps.com, joined here by Jacob Blaine, Patrick Monin, and Stephanie Ot. This is the final breakdown of the year, but it's not the traditional one. We're going to be going ev over every single championship game that is on Saturday. We have separate videos for the Utah-USC Pac-12 game and the UTSA North Texas game. But without further ado, let's jump right into it and get started. So the first one is the Big 12 championship game featuring Kansas State at TCU. I have a strong feeling this is going to be one that leads to some disagreement on this video. Um, I can already tell you there will be based off of the report card. And Patrick, you have a small play in this game. So as someone with not as huge of a lean, I'm going to start it out with you before we get into the big passionate arguments on both sides here. Yeah, so I am on Kansas State money line, smaller play. I mean, fading TC throughout the season has been a pretty rough proposition as far as the uh, the pocketbook goes. But if you really look over the last five weeks of the season, this Kansas State team has been playing as hot as anybody. Their average margin of victory over their last uh, last four wins has been twenty eight point two five points. So this is a team that not only wins, they win pretty resoundingly in their their run defense specifically against everyone not named Bajad Robinson has been pretty sound. They've really held up held up quite well. And if you look at what Kansas State does offensively, they run the ball better than, than just about any team in the country right now behind Deuce Vaughn and TCU defensively, they're slated anywhere between 55th and, and 65th in the country right now when it comes to defending the run. I know they had a good game against Texas, which gives me some pause, and, and just fading this TCU team in general has been pretty rough all season. But if you look on paper, which is what you're supposed to do in these situations, just evaluate these teams for what they are, I do think there is some value in, in Kansas State here. Plus, I also think there's, there's a situational spot where I think TCU's at a point now where they can lose this game and still get into the college football playoff. Not necessarily that they're approaching it in that way, but I think that's in the back of people's minds where it wasn't as much the case against Iowa State last week. So I'm not going to call for a letdown spot. I've been calling for that all season with this team, but I do think there's more of an opportunity for a much better Kansas State team than what Baylor or Iowa State was to, uh, to come in an upset here. All right, Jacob. Yeah, I wouldn't. I'm not really approaching this from a situational standpoint. I'm just approaching this from the standpoint of, I think Kansas state is the better football team. Um, they were up 20 to 10 over TCU in that first game before Adrian Martinez and Will Howard got hurt. Jake Rubley came in, attempted one pass and it was an interception. And then they just tried to run the ball on every play and TCU just shut them down. And they had no dynamic passing attack whatsoever. Um, Will Howard was great in that game before the injury. And I think he's going to be great this week. Um, the biggest thing for me is going to be Kansas State has to find more of a pass rush than they did in that game. Max Duggan averaged 3.32 seconds time to throw in the pocket in that game. And you look at this Kansas State defense, and they have a very good secondary, ranked 40th in the country by PFF, but their pass rush has been very inconsistent. 91st in defensive havoc this year, and Felix Naduke Uzama, who is a potential first-round pick in the NFL, has to become a big in this game. He was signing in that first matchup, just two pressures. And with TCU in a pass-first game script down the stretch, uh, Max Duggan had a lot of time in the pocket to find his open receivers downfield. Uh, but you look at this Kansas State offense, and you know, like Patrick mentioned, Deuce Vaughn, fantastic running back who had 6.9 yards per carry in that first matchup and is going to be a big factor here. TCU's defense is outside the top 100 in finishing drives and explosiveness allowed. So the Kansas State defense is far superior. Uh, Kansas State ranks, or sorry, TCU ranks 124th in pass play explosiveness allowed. So Kansas State should find some big passing plays here. Malik Knowles has to be big in this game. He's been relatively hit or miss all season. Um, Benson Newt couldn't have a big game here as well. But ultimately, I think Will Howard does enough to keep this thing close. And I just like Kansas State to get the, the big stop late when it matters the most. I will be honest, like I have a TCU feature from before the season. Um, 16 to 1 odds on them to win the Big 12. So. This is more just a hedge spot for me. I'm still determining how much I want to hedge because I do think Kansas State is a slightly better team, but I'm going to be rooting for TCU on Saturday to catch that ticket. Um, but for this, I'm just going to walk into Kansas State as my hedge bet for now. Stephanie, I'll let you go before I talk about Kansas State. Well, Jacob, thanks to you, I didn't. I wasn't afraid to, to take TCU. The, the books finally started to give them some credit 
uh, favoring them by 10 in that one. I was scared off by the big number, but because of last week's show and everyone was against TCU, I took it. That's making me do it again. I don't want to drop faith in them, at least to get there. I think that they should be locked in for the playoff spot, even if they lose. They have a, you know, an impressive strength of schedule, undefeated. I know there were close games, and I know they played backups in, uh, against Kansas State earlier this season, but TCU does show up when they need to at best. Regardless of what the better team is, they, they can play in those spots. So I do want to take TCU in this one. They have the fourth scoring offense in the country. Max Duggan is now the second in the Heisman race. I know Caleb Williams definitely has that one locked down. But he's been phenomenal this season, too. 29-3 to three touchdown interception ratio. He also has got Keandre Miller leading with six score, 16 scores, over 1,000 rushing yards. I really like TCU in this one, and as much as there's been questions with their defense earlier in the season, they stepped up. Talking about that Texas game, holding Bashawn Robinson to just 12 carries. I mean, I, I trust this team to step up when they need to, and never have they needed to any more than now. So I think that comeback win by 18 points earlier in the season that doesn't look great in the eyes of the committee and I know that TCU is looking at that and they're they're thinking beyond this game they're going to continue to keep proving that they're they're worth their spot so I do want to take them to win I'm going to lay the two with them but also there's a second half bet that I'm just as confident in their second half team I, d I do think they'll win it in the second half so I'm taking their second half spread to lay one and a half all right, <clears throat> this one is pretty straightforward for me. I, I, I've been saying it for the past few weeks. I was predicting this game to happen, and if it did, I was going to be all in on Kansas State, and I am. You are getting a ridiculous discount on the better football team because Will Hallard and Martinez got hurt in that game. If they don't get hurt, Kansas State wins that game by 21-plus points in my eyes. I think TCU had no chance of coming back. They were getting dominated on the field. Kansas State looks so deflated after the second injury. And and due to that, you're getting a ridiculous discount. In my opinion, I know the books wouldn't have it at this number. I see Kansas State as a seven-point better team than TCU. They are better almost in every place, in my opinion, except maybe the wide receiving core. I love this Kansas State football team. I've been saying it all year long. And while I'm sad for the team itself that they have three losses on the season... For me, I'm kind of happy about it because I feel like I'm getting an insane value here. I think the Texas game, they went up against Texas at their best, which is really hard. I think Texas at their best is one of the best teams in the country, and they were just off and on all season. I think they, they had a letdown spot against Tulane. There's not much to excuse that. And then the TCU game, there is an excuse. It's the fact both your quarterbacks get hurt. What are you supposed to do? As long as Will Howard doesn't get hurt again in this game, I don't see it going... As crazily, I don't think Kansas State wins by like two or three touchdowns, but I do think Kansas State takes care of business. I have two and a half units on their money line at plus one and a half, and I also have three tenths of a unit, very particular. Um, on a little parlay I created because I think Kansas State wins this game by a touchdown, so minus six and a half, and then I have their scoring prop, if I can find it now that it's gone away, to score over 30 and a half points in this one. Yeah, I mean, I could go into the stats and dynamics of this game, but I really think I've seen everything I needed to see in that first half of the of the first game that they played. I also think, also think Kansas State's pretty motivated to come out and show and and basically finish what they were going to do if, if their quarterback didn't get hurt. I think TCU's going to have a little bit of a letdown spot. I know that sounds crazy in a championship game, but I don't know if they fully realize that they're going up, in, in my opinion, they're, they're not the more talented team. And I don't know if they're going to be able to schematically account for that, and I don't think they do. Um, I don't think they're able to pull out the miracle one last time on the season. So that's where I'm at. Matt, one thing I want to add super quick is Will Howard was pretty impressive in that game against TC in the first matchup before he got hurt, but he wasn't projected to be the starter there. Adrian Martinez took the first snap and then got hurt. Or maybe he got hurt, maybe he hurt in the... I can't remember exactly, but Will Howard um, was not expected to start that game, and he's been getting all the pregame or all the first team reps throughout practice this week for the past couple of weeks now, and he's looked better and better every week, and I think he is not maybe not quite on the same par as Max Duggan, but I think he's closer than some people would believe, and I think he will be even better in this matchup than he was that first time around. Yeah, I think it was. A, I think he got one snap, got hurt. Howard came in, played pretty well. And he got hurt right before halftime, if I'm not mistaken. So, that's it. We're, we're definitely... Stephanie's 
staying on the TCU train. I tried to hop on a couple times throughout the season. I weirdly always picked the bad spots to hop on. I'm finally actually betting against TCU in this one, and we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. So, fun, or Stephanie, unless you have any kind of rebuttal, I want to give you a chance being the TCU. I just want to know my record when I'm on an island. I feel like it's pretty good. If we can get some kind of stat review on that. Whenever you all doubt me, I tend to do better, so that pushes me to take them even more. The same thing happens with the Frogs. Whenever everyone doubts them, they do better. So I always will take a team with a chip on their shoulder. Both teams do have that in this one, but one of them has a playoff spot to lose, so take the Frogs. Fair enough. We'll have the well, seventy. Just to, oh, go ahead. just to clarify, I will be rooting for TCU on Saturday because I really hope I can do, I can catch my futures bet. Um, yeah, <laughs> I was saying pre pre thing you could you should treat the TCU future as a hedge on the fact that you should be betting more money on Kansas State, but that's that's just my personal opinion. TCU's that's been profitable all season. You guys have been missing out. It, it's true. They have been. They have. I, it's. You know, just because you get dealt aces, you know, eight times in a row doesn't mean you're going to get dealt aces. But that's not time. luck. Like, you can't have that – you can't be that lucky repetitively. Like, luck is when opportunity meets preparation. So they prepare for those spots and they can perform. Can't say the same about my home team last weekend, but when you can perform in big games, that's what that's what makes you a good team. So, yeah, one may have more talent versus the other or a better scheme, but who can execute better? And I definitely will take TCU to do that. I see. I agree on that statement. I'm talking about the luck, and they seemingly always play against hurt teams, and not even hurt going into the game. Like getting your QB hurt during the game or getting key players hurt during the game is the worst because you're not prepared for that. And I feel like TCU kept getting lucky with that. I, I will give them credit; they 100% have executed on the field, like every single game. And that's, I mean, that's the reason I'm not going to pull in a Patrick and place in 60 units on Kansas State. The defense that I thought I was going to hear from you guys that I don't have a rebuttal in is how they both played Baylor. TCU was in a very close one with Baylor, whereas Kansas State, I think they won by like 18. I did, so that was the only I, one I was like, hopefully I don't bring that up. <laughs> I was scared if I brought that up, you'd bring up the fact that Kansas State won 10-9 to against Iowa State and TCU just won by There's Yeah, points. TCU has played far more, I think, at um, just an equal margin. But, again, just, you guys could uh, – backups and stuff like that so <laughs> i'm not a huge fan of common opponent as a, a metric for measuring what team is going to win a game i think each game has its own character and different dynamics going on and like adrian martinez started the iowa state game for example and they're a different offense with will howard under center so i i, I don't know that, that's not really a part of my argument here well to finish things off as, as a huge fan of the color purple my favorite color i'm just going to enjoy the game it's going to be two great uniforms. I'm excited to watch. So we got Kansas State money line. I got two and a half units. Patrick a quarter unit. Jacob full unit at plus one fifteen. I have my little parlay of Kansas State minus six and a half and over thirty and a half total points for Kansas State at plus three fifty. <clears throat> now down to plus three twenty, three tenths of a unit. And then Stephanie minus two on TCU uh, to win the whole game, and then minus one and a half for the second half half unit on each of those. It's going to wrap it up. Let us move on to the next. And that next next game is going to be the MAC Championship game, and I am very excited to talk about Toledo at Ohio. We have been talking about the MAC for the past few weeks during their MAC Shin Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday games, whatever, whatever dates they are. It's been really fun. Jacob and I hopping on all of them. Jacob, because of that, I'm going to lead with you. Do you have a read for this one? Yeah, this is such a difficult game to handicap, man, with the quarterback injuries. Um, in a perfect world, this would have been Curtis Work versus Daquan Finn, and it would have been so much fun. Um, really sad that Curtis Work got hurt uh, after the season, and I would I would imagine he'll be in the Power Five next year at, at some point. Um, and the same is probably true for Daquan, Daquan Finn. He's probably going to play somewhat, but he's re- he's just clearly not healthy. Um, like he he's just really really limited, especially in his mobility right now. And he is a dual threat quarterback who needs that mobility to be very successful. Tucker Gleason was a better quarterback than him last week, which was weird to see because Daquan Finn, like in a vacuum, is obviously a much better player. But I think Tucker Gleason gives him a better chance of winning this game. But ultimately, the biggest handicap for me is the Toledo defense is the best unit on the field in this, in this game. Uh, Ohio's going to have to run the ball quite a bit with C.J. Harris. C.J. Harris is a dual threat quarterback who gives the bobs a bit more on the ground. But it's all going to be about C. Bongura, their running back, who is averaging 139 yards per game over his last three, five touchdowns in that span. But 
Toledo ranks eighth in rush play success rate allowed, 21st in defensive line yards, and overall they have the best defense in the MAC, uh, eighth in the defensive success rate this season. So I think their defense will be able to hold firm. I'm just very curious to see what they can do on offense. Hopefully, Daquan Finn is healthier than he's shown in recent weeks, but even if he's not, I think Tucker Gleason can do enough to help him get the win here. I just think they're the best team in the MAC. I think they've proven that repeatedly this season, and I think they should be favored to win this game, maybe a bit more than one and a half. It did open at Toledo minus four and a half and got hammered down to minus one and a half or minus two, um, probably because of Finn's you know injury status over the past couple of weeks. But ultimately, I just think Toledo is a better team here, and I'll put a half unit with the speculation of what's happening at quarterback for them. Yeah, it's really tough for me. I'm just going to butt in really quick. I don't have a play on this game because of the QB injuries and I just don't feel completely comfortable betting. I, I tried to do research and I just feel like I can't get a read on these two teams without their starting quarterbacks. And I think we were robbed of an absolute classic of a game. Like I was, I, I would like this with Kansas State and TCU going on to, it was going to be such a good day. I'm actually really sad about it, but I'm just not going to watch it now. <laughs> I'm just going to avoid the game completely. Stephanie, look like you have some plays from this one. Yeah, if I have a lean and Jacob takes the opposite, I'm going to take it <laughs> just to challenge you. Um, yeah, I do think like, Ohio's been on a roll. They've they've won seven in a row. I think it's a, a hot team to jump on. I wish I got the spread at four. That would have been great. But I'm going to take the money line and them to cover here. Um, yeah, I think that the quarterback issue is a, a, a big spot. Um, I don't want to bet a trendy bet or anything like that. But um, I do think that... Toledo could could win this one, and I'm I'm willing to bet on it. Turnovers could play a big one in this one. Uh, Toledo's 100th in FBS with a minus nine turnover differential, but Ohio is fourth in the nation. Um, The Rockets' defense, they have the best in the conference. Jacob also commented on that being the best unit on the field, but they've allowed 135 points over the past five games. That's four points per game over the season average and concerning against an offense that hasn't missed a beat without their their quarterback. So I'm willing to bet on this one uh, going against Jacob, and, you know, i got to go with Ohio. I'm I'm a graduate of the MAC conference, so I'll uh, I'll put some money on it. But mainly because my record shows that I need to continue going against Jacob unless it's my actual home team of Ohio State. We're definitely going to invest on the offseason on a Jacob versus Stephanie graphic um, just to make these videos. I feel like we're pretty even. (laughs) Patrick... Very similar to me, you're just kind of quiet in the corner on this game, and I imagine you were looking forward to, forward, forward to it as well without the QB injuries, but are you kind of in the same boat? Yeah, definitely a similar boat. I was looking about Ohio in this game because I do agree that Toledo's defense has been really good. I mean, if you look at them, they're a top 15 run defense, top 15 coverage unit. Not many teams can say that they're they're upper echelon in both, and they can. But I do think if you look a little deeper, they have been. You have been able to exploit this defense with good quarterback play, and that's something I think you could have seen Ohio do had Rourke and this this offense been fully healthy. I think I'm just going to stay off it just because of the uncertainty at this point. I, I do still think there's some value in Ohio because I like what their offensive pieces can do. I think they'll be able to move the ball against this Toledo team, especially in one-off quarterback situations. I think you always get a little bit of value, but you can kind of say the same thing about Daquan Finn and in Toledo in this case. So, yeah, I'm I'm staying off of it. Um, there's really I, – I don't know. I really don't have – a whole lot other than I think Toledo's defense is good. I'm not really sure what we're getting out of Ohio's offense, even though I do think they have some value. Yeah, maybe I'll add, I'm a little biased as well. I think I'm, I'm even more in the, the boat with you, Patrick, than I realized, because I really wanted to come into this game and bet Ohio. I really thought, you know, if Rourke was, you know, healthy, I was looking forward to this one because I kind of predicted these two teams to end up in the championship game when we started the action games. I felt like they were two of the better teams in the conference and, Maybe it was a little too high on Buffalo to start out. Um, but I felt like Ohio matched up so well against Toledo. Now, without with all the uncertainty, it's kind of like, I can't fully lean Toledo. I can't fully lean Ohio. I just, I just, I'm just going to stay out of it. I'll let Jacob and Stephanie have their feud and just enjoy it from the sideline. So, our picks. Toledo thing, uh, minus two. Oh, go ahead. Last thing I want to add, Matt, is just keep an eye on both these guys next year. Uh, Daquan Finn and Curtis Work. I think they're both going to be in Power 5 teams, and I'm going to be excited to back whatever teams they transfer to because I think they're both very talented quarterbacks, and it's a shame that they're not playing this week. I think Rourke should be a draft pick. That's my I, that I could be a scalding hot take, but that's my. 
by my action analysis. <laughs> All right, so we got Toledo minus two for Jacob <clears throat> at a half unit. Stephanie, half unit on the money line and spread for Ohio, which is at plus two, minus 110, and plus 110 for the money line. All right, moving on to the next one. We got the Sun Belt Championship game, Coastal Carolina at Troy. That is the college, not the location. And uh, an interesting game, eight and a half a point spread in favor of Troy, over under of 48. I'm going to be completely honest. Um, this was not one of the championship games I had circled. Doing very minimal like research into these first into these teams. At first, I wasn't going to make a play. And then when I dug into it, watched some tape from Coastal Carolina, I've watched a couple of their games this season, I don't know, I kind of want to back them for fun, so this is not betting advice, but I will have a quarter unit on them at plus eight and a half. I am going to kick things off with you, Stephanie, because I don't see a bet for you, but I was curious if you have any analysis you want to provide on it. I kind of want to go on an island again. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, it's like like you said, it's the last show of the season, I might, I might play uh, pretty, pretty bold here. Um, I can see why Troy's favorite in this one. They won nine straight, came off back-to-back double-digit wins, and then you have Coastal Carolina lost two of their most recent as a 25-point favorite, and they'd only be in their previous two opponents by a combined 10 points. So I do think momentum is a, a key component here. Um, Troy's averaging a good 9.6 uh, scoring margin across their six home games. Um, so... I haven't I haven't looked at this conference enough to to go super bold on this, but the sole fact that all of you are leaning the opposite side of me does make me want to take it. So I'll I'll see your arguments and and wait to see if I if I want to go against you. All right, Patrick, you're up first in dissuading Stephanie to go against you. Yeah, so I think if you're like if you're a quote unquote numbers person, like Troy's going to be. The better team across the board, but I think a lot of that is priced in at, at eight and a half. I think that's that's a pretty steep number for a championship game. And if you've really looked at one area where Troy has struggled this season, it's been in pass protection. And Coastal Carolina has been pretty good at generating pressure. It's it's been a pretty consistent calling card of their defense. So I think they'll be able to get to Gunnar Watson and slow down this team a little bit. I, I do think part of me wants to wait. And maybe bet this one live because I think especially if Coastal Carolina puts up points early, I think Troy could be in trouble because Troy has been able to run the ball for stretches. But I think if they have to throw the ball, then then they might be in trouble a little bit. So I think there's value at the eight and a half, but I think there might be even more value live if uh, if Troy's playing from behind. I just re- I, I muted myself, unmuted myself, and muted myself. Well, you'd think I'd learn after I don't know how many episodes of this. Jacob, <laughs> who do you have in this one? Yeah, I'm just putting a half unit for now. Uh, it's just pure speculation that there's a chance that Grayson McCall could play. Um, if he goes, he's he's the best quarterback in college football since 2020 in terms of EPA. He's absolutely fantastic. Uh, this Coastal team lost a ton of pieces uh, from last year and on the offensive line and the skill position room and across the board. Um, and his ability to run this offense is what kept them afloat and kept them winning games all year. And then he got hurt against Appalachian State, and it just hasn't been the same. Uh, the drop-off to Jared Guess and Bryce Carpenter has been massive. Um, he might be the most valuable quarterback to the spread in the country right now, I'm not going to lie, because of where this offense is in terms of supporting talent and how good he is. Um, apparently, there's a chance he could play, which I didn't think there was previously. Uh, but the rumors today, they said on the radio show, Jamie Chadwell said that he's, he's going to try to give it a go. He's like working through warm-ups and stuff. If the game was today, he wouldn't play, but by Saturday, maybe. Um, if he goes, this spread should be, at most, Troy minus two and a half, maybe Coastal favorite here. Uh, if he doesn't go, like I, I think it could be Troy minus 10, honestly. So, it's just a speculative play for me right now. I'll put a half unit just in case he goes, and hopefully he pulls a Bobby Boucher in place of the injury, and you know, I, I think I think I would love that. I mean, this is probably Jimmy Chavo's last game at Coastal. He has offers on the table from Liberty and USF, but I wouldn't be surprised if he gets a higher profile offer than that even. And Grayson McCall might be headed to the NFL or potentially to a Power 5 team. So it would be cool if both those guys can give it a go in their last game together. And, you know, I'm going to take the value on a speculation for Coastal for now. All right. With all that said, said, Stephanie, are you still on Troy? I'm taking it. I... (laughs) So I think no one has really like commented on how good Troy's defense is. I know, Patrick, you said don't look at the numbers, but I really don't think you can undersell Scott Cross's defense. 
They're seventh in the nation in scoring defense, allowing just 16.83 points per game. Um, they're also better against the spread. Coastal Carolina, two and five in their last seven. Uh, Troy, they are, let me find it here. I had a second ago. Oh, Troy is eight and two in their last 10 overall. Again, I, I like momentum with them in this one. And I really, I think, I, I don't want to take the total uh, based off of the Troy defense. So they've been winning by a margin just under this, but their average is uh, nine. Point six uh, point differential, like how much they're winning by. So I don't know. The one point is a, a little iffy, but since you guys are are so hot on Coastal, I'll, I'll take Troy. I I think their defense is the X factor in this one, and they'll be able to hold Coastal. I'll take. Yeah, that. I should have said that. Troy has maybe the best defense in the group of five. Um, yeah, seven I mean, in the scoring it, defense, six in yards allowed, twelfth in limiting explosiveness, fifth in PFF coverage grade. Like they're a fantastic defense, and if Grissom McCall doesn't go, then I, I mean, Coastal is going to be hard pressed to score more than 10 points in this game with their backup quarterback situation. So I definitely don't think that's a bad side. Um, I'm just emotionally betting on Grayson McCall and like hoping he gives it a go. But even if he does, like he's not going to be at 100%. So even still, like Troy might have the upper hand in this game. All right. So we have speculative half unit from Jacob on Coastal, we have a half unit from Patrick on Coastal. Quarter unit on Coastal for me. And uh, Stephanie, going to go half unit the other way. Kind of match our energy. and I'm going to go full unit, guys. Full unit. She doesn't oh, give unit. it up. I should give each of you a half unit. I'll go against each of you individually at a half unit and just shoot 1.5. But I'm going to stick with my one. <laughs> All right. So it's going to wrap it up for the Sun Belt Championship game. Let us move on to the next and this is one of the big ones on the slate. We have the LSU at Georgia game for the SEC championship game. LSU is a team I absolutely do not want to talk about right now. They ruined a beautiful money line parlay for myself, losing to Texas A&M, which at this point is probably the most embarrassing loss for any Power 5 school to have is a loss to Texas A&M. Pathetic performance from them, and Brian Kelly, I hate you. So, 17.5 point spread in this one. Stephanie, where are you going with your money, also the over-under of 51. Um, sorry if I made you laugh a little too hard there. Too. Oh, man. Know, God, your one-liners, they truly kill me. Um, Frank Kelly. He was my savior earlier. Uh, Notre Dame was upsetting Clemson, but I think South Carolina took the cake of that one. Um, okay, so this one, I had LSU at first to cover, and... I, I, I started to lean towards the under here. I think that the Georgia defense is the big X factor. I don't think LSU will be able to score on this one. Meanwhile, I do think Georgia can run through LSU's defense that got, like you said, kind of worn down by Texas A&M. That was bad. So um, I don't want to rely on Georgia because they are a lock in the playoff, and we saw how they've done in, in recent SEC championships. They won the national championship after losing to Alabama last year. In the conference title game, uh, they lost to LSU with Burrow. A uh, granted, that's like an X factor team, but this is a spot where Georgia's sitting comfy at seed number one. They're not moving whatsoever. They they locked that in all season long. Even after losing nine starters on defense, they they replenished remarkably. They're allowing just eleven point two points per game, best in the nation. Um, but it also doesn't help that Jalen Daniels was injured last week and that loss. He was walking in a boot Monday going to play but still not great going up against uh georgia defense um and also the total it's gone under in 10 of georgia's last 14 games i attribute a lot of that to the georgia defense so that's who i'm betting on uh to keep this lower scoring also with their their playoff lingering um looking forward to that so i don't think that they'll be overly pounding down the pavement on i mean offense. yeah Georgia hasn't had their foot on the gas all season. I, I truly do not hate that bet, Stephanie. I think if I were to make a bet, it would be that one. I'm just going to force myself not to play one in this game because I, I do think there's a wide range of outcomes due to the kind of weird nature of what's happened where LSU's out of the football playoffs. Georgia's locked in number one, like you mentioned. But I do like that under 51 because I don't trust LSU's offense, especially with the binged up Daniels. And Georgia's just, they, they've just been Georgia. They've just been cruising every single game. Patrick. The infamous SEC championship game from last year, where 
I'm pretty sure you cussed out Nick Saban or something like that. I mean, it gets exaggerated every single time it gets told. It's like a folklore story, but this is your redemption. We're we're here again, SEC championship. What are you go? Where are you going with your money? Yeah, God forbid I said a, a Georgia team with six NFL draft picks was gonna beat a beat an Alabama team that was marginally overvalued. And I was wrong, and I might be wrong again, but I, I did go back and forth in this game. Ultimately, landed on LSU as a result of both the number and and just Georgia in this spot because I don't, they, Georgia team they haven't really looked looked like a world beater outside of that Oregon game in Week One. I thought even that Tennessee game they were playing at home. I thought they benefited from weather and in a Jalen Hyatt injury halfway through that game. So I think you factor that in alongside a seventeen and a half number against a team that in LSU is coming off an embarrassing loss, and I, I do think you're getting some value on LSU here. Georgia really they have nothing to gain in this game. I, I would say they have seeding, which is meaningful in this spot, but I still think LSU has has more to gain than Georgia has to lose by winning here. And I think if you look at matchups, LSU, they're pretty weak in, in pass protection. Not weak, but they're it's not great. It's probably where one of their weaknesses lies. They give up a sack about one every 10 dropbacks right now, which is really bad. And if you look at the defense that Georgia's been playing this year, they really haven't generated a lot of pressure, which is kind of contrary to what you what you think of Georgia teams. They they really rush three or four most plays, play quarters coverage, and send out linebackers up the middle on delayed rushes. So I think that actually, if they play that same style that plays right in a, I think what LSU wants to do offensively, I think they can dial it up with Jane Daniels a little bit more here and, and have potential to beat this Georgia team over the top. So I don't doubt that Georgia's a better team, but it's a lot of points in a championship game. And like I said, we saw the same situation last year against an inferior Alabama team. This defense, they do let down in some spots. Their offense is good enough to win games, but but they're not good enough to cover big spreads like this. And you're right, Patrick. I mean, we I bring that up a lot as a joke, but I do think your pick when we went head-to-head last year in the SEC championship game, like, I, I don't blame your pick. I, I, you almost even swayed me during that video because you brought up so many good points. Um, not swaying me to put any money on LSU, though, after what I saw last week. Jacob, you're going with Georgia. Where, first of all, you have it at 16.5. What are the odds on that number where you found it right now? Oh, I don't know if that number is still available, but I gave it out on Twitter a few days ago. But I would play it up to, I mean, whatever the number is right now, I'm fine with. What's the number right now, Matt? It's 17 and a half at minus 110. Yeah, that's fine. Um, okay. Hopefully you don't get hooked on that number, but I think Georgia's going to win by 28 points. I, I don't I just don't see this being close at all. Um, Georgia has had a, a pretty Jekyll and Hyde season, but they've shown up when it's mattered most in their bigger games, and I think it's going to be the same here. Um, their tight ends should eat in this game against an LSU secondary that really just hasn't been good at all. They rank 91st in coverage on PFF. Um, you know, LSU's defense is heavily reliant on their pass rush, and they do have an outstanding pass rush duo in Harold Perkins and B.J. Ojolari. But you look at Seth and Bennett, and he hasn't been sacked in any of Georgia's last five games. See, their offensive line is excellent, and when it's not excellent, he gets rid of the ball intelligently and quickly. And that's why they rank seventh in offensive havoc allowed. So LSU is not going to live in their backfield like they have against some of these other teams, including Alabama. And that was a big issue in that game. I just don't see the same thing happening here on the road against Georgia. And then you look at the other side, and Georgia's going to have Georgia's going to force LSU to run consistent offense. LSU ranks 112th in offensive explosiveness, 38th, and Georgia's 38th in defensive explosiveness allowed. And LSU is going to really struggle because they're so reliant on their run game, and Georgia's run defense is excellent. And it, it doesn't help at all that Jaden Daniels got hurt at the end of that last game. Um, he's in a walking boot, reportedly. And even if he's able to, fu- to to play and give it a go, like his mobility is going to be severely hampered in this game. And so much of his game is mobility and his ability to run and get out in space. And you're also going to see their interior offensive line struggle against J1 Carter, who's one of the most uh, dom- dominant defensive forces in college football right now. And, you know, this isn't the same Georgia defense as last year. They definitely aren't as elite, but... I still think they have a far superior advantage here uh, against this LSU offense. And I think their red zone struggles will progress uh, here as well. Georgia's had a hard time punching it in in the red zone. And I don't think that's going to be as much of an issue against this LSU secondary. So LSU really was a letdown last week. And, you know, it was a look ahead spot. So perhaps there could be value on them here. But I really just don't see their matchup advantages. And I think the injury to Jaden Daniels makes things just that much harder. All right, so heard from everyone, and uh, 
the official picks are in. We got under 51 for Stephanie. We got Georgia minus 17 and a half now. Uh, full unit for Jacob. He got it 16 and a half. Again, you can follow Jacob on Twitter to get official picks as they come in. He's trying to get those sharp lines. Patrick definitely did not mind waiting. He'll take the plus 17 and a half on LSU for a full unit. And that's going to wrap it up for the SEC championship game. A little bit more of a letdown than we usually have for, for this game, but Georgia's kind of run away for the conference. LSU's been a letdown, so we move on to the next one. And next one is going to be the American Athletic Conference Championship. We got University of Central Florida at Tulane. Um, interesting game with UCF pulling off the, I think technically an upset a few weeks ago. The infamous Tulane minus one and a half. I don't know where I put my sign, but if you guys remember that from the Saturday Slate video. Now the spread is three and a half in favor of Tulane. And Jacob, since you're the only one with somewhat of an official play here, I'm going to let you go first um, talking about this game. Yeah, I've really struggled with this one because I, I, I obviously want to back Tulane. I've, I've had a, a lot of fun backing them throughout the season, but I don't love the value at minus three and a half. So I'm just doing a little money line parlay, putting a unit on it with Tulane, Michigan, and Georgia money line parlay to get back to clo close to even odds. Um, but let me talk about this Tulane team. And Ty J. Spears has been in, on an absolute tear recently. He's averaging 144 yards per game and nine total touchdowns over his last six games. He only had eight carries in that first matchup. He did have 130 yards on him, but uh, UCF got out to a really early lead. They were up 24-7 to seven at one point, and this two-win offense that really wants to establish their ground game couldn't. They had to pass the ball a ton in the second half to come back, and they almost did. They only lost by seven points in that game, and they made some great halftime adjustments, and Willie Fritz proved why he's one of the better coaches in the country right now, but... Ultimately, I think Tulane is going to learn from that and come out more prepared for this UCF team. The big concern here for me and why I'm not willing to completely lay the points is because the Tulane run defense uh, struggled in that first matchup. Their defensive line really wasn't good in that game, and they rank 105th in line yards. They just gave up 235 rushing yards and three touchdowns to Cincinnati, who hasn't run the ball all this season. Uh, their biggest strength is the secondary, but UCF runs the ball at the 29th highest rate, so they really want to establish that ground game with guys like Isaiah Bowser and RJ Harvey. John Reese Plumley, fantastic rushing quarterback. Uh, they ran for six and a half yards per carry in that first game. And if they do that again, it'll be tough for Tulane to cover that three and a half. I still do like them to win. I think Tajay Spears is fantastic. Michael Pratt has been just consistently great every week. And this Tulane defense has some playmakers, regardless of their defensive line and consistency. But ultimately, I think they pull out the win at home. And what should be just a rocking atmosphere in New Orleans this weekend. All right, Stephanie, can we get a temperature check on the green wave from you? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, <laughs> I, it's a, been a great comeback story. I don't know if I'm willing to, to bet on this one. Uh, the main component is UCF's run game. Uh, Tulane, 74th uh, run defense. They're going up against UCF's 7th nationally ranked rushing offense. They're ninth in total offense. Uh, that's really what killed them earlier in the season when they faced off. They lost the turnover battle 2-0 um, against UCF, and they gave up 336 rushing yards, four rushing touchdowns. Until that game, they only gave up 12 rushing touchdowns this season. I mean, really, UCF did a number on them. Like, Jacob, you mentioned that they could learn from this, but, I mean, on the season, they allowed just 3.98 yards per carry, and then they allowed 6.2 against UCF. So I would hope they can – learn from this I don't know if I'm willing to bet on it I mean we saw that they're they're a comeback team they were uh what two and ten last season they completely flipped the script this season so they are a team that I want to bet on but I'm not willing to do it in this spot I really do think UCS is going to be able to run through them again so it's hard to play a team twice um so I mean Tulane has that in their favor uh after UCF won earlier but yeah I'm not I'm not overly confident on on betting one side I'm, I'm starting to get a little passionate about my pick, but I'm going to let Patrick let you say your piece before I get, I get into mine and talk about this UCF team. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm similar to Jacob where I do like Tulane. I thought they had a rough first quarter against UCF where they were down by 17, but then they were really going to come on late. And I think if you just look at their ability to run the ball, they're going for about five yards of rush on the season. And I thought – they really got the running game going in that second half against UCF. And so I think offensively, 
they could be able to ball control this team that, you know, I mean, UCF struggled to keep Navy off the field for large stretches. So I think you're kind of seeing some cracks in the in the armor, so to speak, there for UCF. But you also can't erase from my memory the fact that they were able to get that lead in the first place. I think their defense also kind of took their foot off the gas a little bit. So, like, there's a little bit of dichotomy there. And I also just feel like there's a whole lot of value in this number right now. Um, at three and a half, I just feel like there's better games on the board, and I don't have a strong enough read to really put my foot down one side or the other. Um, and especially if I'm leaning too lane, a favorite over three points, I, I just don't love it, to be honest with you. Yeah, so, I don't know, I feel like I've struggled this year because I have run into quite a few unlucky spots. Look no further than the Dolphins team total over of 30 and a half uh, this week. Where I feel like I start questioning my process a little bit because I'm getting unlucky. And I do think at a certain point when you're sports betting and you're losing a lot, like you 100% you need to question your process. You need to be like, okay, where am I going wrong? But at the same time, I think sports betting and poker have quite a bit in common where you could play an optimal game and there's going to be ebbs and flows. And I'm just going to trust my process on this one. UCF plus three and a half. I mentioned in the Tulane Cincinnati game, uh, Jacob can vouch for me all over Tulane. I even had a, a nice parlay at plus 170 that hit with under Cincinnati 24 and a half points and Tulane money line. And that's because if you're a passing football team, you're not beating Tulane. That coverage unit is terrifying. I I think the only other team I wouldn't want to go up against if I'm a passing football team is Georgia. Like Tulane is scary. But if you can run the football, you can absolutely just control the game and get Tulane out of their rhythm. And I mentioned that in the Cincinnati video. That's why I felt like UCF had so much success. And I feel like game three and a half, I'm getting over a field goal. It's just too big of value, and it's at minus 105. It's not even at the even minus 110 that you normally get. Um, so I, I feel pretty confident. I think UCF, once again, they're going to rush for 200-plus yards. They're going to control the football. Will Tulane win this game? I think there's a, a pretty solid chance, but are they going to win by more than three and a half points? I actually think a majority of possibilities are, are leaning you know, within that three-point spread with either side, I think UCF at plus 155 honestly isn't the worst shout on the money line, but I'm going to keep it simple and just do a half unit on UCF plus three and a half. Uh, trust my process on this one that I love this two-lane team. I don't like Bane against them, but I just cannot see them stopping the run game for UCF. And due to that, it's hard to see their offense just gain into an absolute rhythm and kind of taking it to UCF's defense and running away with it. I, I really can't see it happening in this one. Matt, let me ask you this, because I'm looking, I'm trying to look at this matchup, and the best unit on the field is definitely the UCF run offense. But second to that, I to, to your point, two lanes passing defense is just up there too. So it's like, what unit wins this game, do you think? Like, do you think that yep. UCF's run game is going to win it again, or did Tulane learn from that? Or do you think they're, they're going to force them to pass where that's where they excel? So I, I don't know which unit to bet on. I think Tulane's defense is not built in a way where they can load the – like, they have a great coverage unit, but even when they load the box, they let teams run on them. Like, there's just – and it's like Tulane doesn't get to decide UCF's play calling. So if UCF just sticks to the run – I mean, honestly, if I'm the coach, even if I go down 14 nothing and I'm UCF, I'm like, I got to keep running the football. That's the only way you're going to come back against Tulane because I just don't believe in John Reese Plumlee to pass on this insane coverage unit. So – I don't. The reason why I'm not too worried about that matchup, I'm okay taking plus three and a half, is because UCF gets to dictate their calls on offense, right? Tulane doesn't get to make them throw the football unless they really get to a crazy lead. And I just, again, I'm, I'm I guess I'm hoping that doesn't happen. That's the kind of, you know, outcomes where I end up losing this bet. Matt, one thing that's definitely worth bringing up here is I'm not even sure if Johnny Plum is going to start this game. Um, it that's might be true. Mikey Keen. Mikey Keen has looked pretty good. Um, He's, he definitely gives him a higher ceiling in terms of the passing game. He's obviously not nearly the runner that John Rose Plumley is, but I, as somebody who's on Tulane, I would prefer it if, if Mikey Keene starts here. Um, yeah. Because Tulane's biggest strength is their secondary, and it would make UCF more of a pass heavy offense, and I think that works to Tulane's favor. Um, I think you will see both quarterbacks, though, regardless. I was going to say best case scenario for me is actually a little bit of a mixture of both. Like, I, I would hope they can lean on John Reese Plumley to run a lot, but bring in Keene to you know, mix it up and even have him, like, I know he's no John Reese Plumley, but you, you can still mix pass, pass and run with him. And I think it could give UCF a little bit of dynamics in this game that actually helped them out. As long as they're both able to play 
when called upon. If John Reese Plumley's like hurt to the extent where he's actually really limited and we don't know, that's definitely hurting my plus three and a half. And that's probably why you're seeing the number creep towards four, four and a half on some of the sports books. <clears throat> All right. So Jacob has that two lane Michigan, Georgia money line parlay that you get minus 105 odds. And I'm on the UCF plus three and a half, half unit there at minus 105. And let us move on to the next game. And that is going to be the Mount West championship game we got the mountain in boise state we got the west in fresno state and uh it's gonna be an interesting one with a three-point spread fresno state come in as underdogs uh spoiler i do think fresno state might be the better team in this one despite being underdogs patrick i'm gonna kick things off with you i know you're one of the top mound west experts you know in the entire industry so where are you going with this one huge mountain west guy 100 percent now, I, I'm interested to see what you and Jacob have to say because I actually think Boise State's a better team here. I just haven't really put anything down. I think these are two good offenses, but I do think Boise State is a better defense, at least for this point, especially against the run. They've allowed just 3.7 yards a carry, and they're a top 15 coverage team right now. So I think defensively they have a bit of an edge where I think offensively Boise State does struggle pass blocking a little bit. But overall, I think both teams are, are pretty sound. And then I think... Yeah, I think Fresno State struggles to slow down some of this Boise State rushing attack where they've really been able to pound the ball. I think they can ball control this game, force them into three and outs or shorter drives. So I was leaning Boise State in this game, but I kind of wanted to hear what, what you guys had to say about it. Well, I'll let Jacob kick things off because honestly, a lot of how I feel about Fresno State has been him kind of <laughs> waxing poetic about them in a couple other videos. And he, he, he changed me into a Fresno State believer this season, so. And then I watched them and felt it for myself. So go ahead, Jacob. Yeah, I mean, I think it just comes from the fact that this is a completely different team when Jake Hayner's in the lineup. Um, it's kind of like Coastal. The, the drop-off from Jake Hayner to their backup, Logan Fife, is massive. Um, this is a very good Boise State defense. They rank sixth in defensive success rate, seventh in finishing drives, first in pass play success rate allowed, very good secondary overall. But where they are a bit vulnerable is they rank 123rd in pass play explosiveness allowed. They tend to gamble. They tend to let up some big passing plays because their corners like to gamble on interceptions. And you see it week after week where opposing quarterbacks can have big plays, even if they aren't consistent on a down-to-down -down basis against this defense. Um, that Boise State uh, cover last week, I was just want to talk about that for a minute. That was absolutely absurd. I don't know if you guys saw what happened, but Boise State was minus 17 against Utah State. They were up five of the 133 remaining. And Utah State had the ball at the 15-yard line, driving to potentially take the lead. And then they got an interception to seal the win. Second play with the ball. They were running the clock out. And Taylor Green, their quarterback, housed it 91 yards and a touchdown. Utah State gets the ball back, trying to drive and score again. And then threw a pick six to lose by 19. So Boise State covered. And it is absolutely absurd. And, it, like, I see that. And I'm like, okay, that probably sets up a little bit of value in the spread uh, to an extent. But ultimately, I think this Boise State team is very good at playing with a lead. When they're forcing teams to throw against their secondary and they have Taylor Green in their run game. Taylor Green has really helped their run game uh, boost up. And George Hulani has been fantastic in recent weeks. But Fresno State can kind of live in the backfield. They rank 21st in Havoc, and Boise State ranks 88th in Havoc allowed. And Taylor Green isn't as good when he's forced to throw. Uh, he was held to only 127 passing yards against Fresno in that first matchup. And if Fresno can get in front, Boise State won't be successful playing from behind in this game. So I think whoever gets the early lead will be very pivotal here. But... Ultimately, I like getting the, the plus value with the better quarterback in this game and Jake Hayner. And I think Fresno is a bit of a value just because of his absence early, earlier in the season is skewing some of their overall stats. Yeah, and I, I, I knew Jacob would put it in a much more beautiful way, but it's Jake Hayner for me. I think with him healthy, he's the best quarterback in this conference, and I don't think it's necessarily close. Shout out to the Danville native, went to Monta Vista High School. Uh He's just a really, really good quarterback, and I'm taking the best quarterback in this matchup. Like, I do believe in Boise State's defense to be a good unit, but I think their numbers, especially EPA numbers and such, are bloated by this conference. I don't think the Mountain West has, has, was very good this year. I think it's one of the poorest years, honestly, it's been in a while. And Jake Hayner has come in, and he's just dominated. 17 touchdowns, 3 interceptions, 2,400 yards. Like, he's so much better than everybody else in this conference that I, I feel very confident in him kind of taking this game by the horns. And, I, and similar to what you said, Jacob, they're getting a little bit of a value. I think 
this game should be a coin flip and I'm getting plus three, plus three and a half, depending on the book. So I feel I, I like that. So Patrick, did we sway you off Boise State? Yeah, I think maybe a little bit. I still like, I'll be interested to see how the Fresno, how the Fres the interior of Fresno State's defensive line works against this Boise State rushing attack. Cause I still think Boise State's going to be able to run the ball here. It's just the question is, is that going to be enough to, to counter what Fresno State's able to do offensively? It's still probably a no play for me, but I think you guys make a cogent points as one Anthony Elio would say. Thank you. Stephanie, I, I mean, you got a read in this game anywhere you're leaning or just kind of laying the bound West B? Since Jacob is taking Fresno State <laughs> and I lean, I mean, I'm, I, I, just, if it, I just wish it was shorter than three. I mean, I don't know. Like, I, I look at the Boise State defense and the old saying, uh, defenses win championships. So I want to take this one. And you look at, you guys commented on Fresno State's quarterback, but Boise State is third in the nation in passing defense, allowing 158.8 passing yards per game. And Fresno State's rushing offenses, I mean, I get that they they have a great running back in Jordan Mims who had over 1,000 yards this season, 14 touchdowns. But they're 94th on, in rushing offense, and I still think Boise State's defense, run defense, can't, can't compete with them. and hold. So they'll get a few scores, I think, in that regard. But, I mean, their secondary it, it can, can definitely stop Fresno State. And then you look at Boise State's offense, who is awful in passing. They're outside the top 100. Fresno State, top 24 against the pass. So I think the biggest matchup would have to be with with Fresno State's passing offense up against that third ranked passing defense in Boise State because I, I feel like they're gonna have to rely on the passing game unless they can get uh, have Mims get through there. But I mean, still Boise State's defense is what, what I want to rely on in this one. I don't want to bet on the quarterback. I want to bet on the defense, and I think that their defense is rock solid. And really, both of these offenses have to rely on on, on one spot. Boise State relies on the rushing game because passing isn't great, but that's where uh, Fresno State's defense is better, so the matchup's kind of all scattered for me. I don't, I'm not overly confident in one, but if there's a spot I want to bet on, just like I did with the other conference championship games, I want to bet on the better defense. And with where they're ranked, ninth in scoring in the nation, seventh total defense. I mean, I want to take Boise State. And if Jacobs kind of bet the other side, I'll put half a unit on Boise State. But I really don't, I really don't like that number. So maybe I'll drop it down to a quarter unit. Right. The saltiness is so real, man. The saltiness is so real as a result I mean, of this. You guys this just Michigan, won the rivalry game Michigan on home turf. Down. Since, this Michigan beat okay. down. I've never Columbus. witnessed Michigan beat Ohio State at the horseshoe. It's been over 20 years since they've done that. So I will bet against you on every other game that I can since the rivalry game didn't go my way. And TCU gonna, has. Okay, I'm, I'm reeling this back in for the very confused Fresno and Boise State fans <laughs> watching this video. I'm going to rebuttal your point a little bit, Stephanie, because this is what I mean um, by saying Boise State. Their numbers are very inflated. Let's look at the teams that they, they did very well um, against in terms of limiting the pass. New Mexico, UT Martin, San Diego State, Fresno State without Haney, Air Force, Colorado State, Nevada, Wyoming, Utah State. When they played BYU and Hall... 29 for 42, 377, three touchdowns. He did throw two picks. I'll give him that. And the same kind of thing happened in the Oregon State game where they ended up throwing for 300 yards, basically, but they did throw two interceptions. So the one thing I'll give Boise State is they have been able to turn the football over even when they have been a little bit weaker in coverage. I just think Hainer's on that level of haul, if, you know, if not better. I know that's I'm going out on a limb here, but I really think he's that kind of quarterback. And, I think a lot of people are getting a little tricked by Boise State's raw numbers because ha like a majority of their games, 75 to 80% of their games have been against legitimately garbage tier quarterbacks in passing games. Like it just isn't there. So I I'm really only focused on that Oregon State, the UTEP, the BYU. I'll throw in the first Fresno State game, but like in those matchups, it just hasn't been at that same level that you would expect from the numbers you gave out. And I will say, whenever I see a good secondary up against a good quarterback, even if Fresno State's offense is on the field as much, I can see their quarterback making big plays and optimizing his time on the field. Yeah. So, that yeah, that's that's the thing that is deterring me. But 
maybe I'll hold off on this game just because I'm not overly confident. But, but yeah, All this right. matchup is a little scattered for me. I will so, say, um, I mean, it feels like a lifetime ago, but Jay Kaner was on his way to leading Fresno State, potentially over an up to an upset win over USC. Um, it feels like forever ago, but that was this season, and he got hurt in that game, and then things fell apart for them. But, like, this Fresno State team had such a higher ceiling if he never gets hurt this season, and I think you're still getting a value with them at plus three and a half. You're seeing this number come down a little bit. So, if you like Boise State, I would wait. Like, there's a good chance you might end up getting a two and a half here, but I think Fresno State has value to, to win this game outright. Do you think there's value in the over? Because I feel like, like if you like Fresno State, I feel like Boise State's going to be able to move the ball too. So I feel like fifty three and a half. I mean, that's yeah. I, like I definitely that number maybe. I definitely lean the over. Um, I'm just confident enough in Fresno State to make it a full unit play, and I'm not necessarily trying to double dip on this game. But I do think this is going to be potentially the best game to watch this entire weekend. Honestly, in terms of it being close, um, depending on how. You know, I guess Big 12 and, and Pac-12 will be very good, too. But I think this game is going to be a phenomenal watch. So, very excited for it. Yeah, Are you taking, Rick, is anyone taking a money line? Yeah, you know what? Screw it. Screw it. Thanks, Stephanie. I'm going half unit on the money line for Fresno State. I mean, State, it's going to be I'm, close, and you're taking the underdog in a close game. Might as well take the money line. And we've talked about this all year, more so in the NFL, but I really think that's just kind of a value play. Like, Yeah. Yeah. I'll put a full unit on Fresno State plus three and a half, half unit on the money line at plus 135 for Fresno State. And we'll see what happens. I mean, a I lot of times wrap the hook will get you. Like, I've seen so many games, at least in the NFL, to your point, where the hook kills you. At least that's yeah. in uh, Boise State's case. But, yeah, the number is way too – I don't like the number for the spread. So, all right. If you guys are all taking Fresno State, should we go all in? No, like Patrick's definitely, definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm off this game. No. Yeah, but be my guest. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not. No, I would only do it if it was a team effort. Yeah, see, no, no team effort. We got I'm Fresno State. Yeah, plus I'm not three and a half me. for Jacob and I. Plus one thirty-five on the money line, half unit for me. And let's let's get off this game and head over to the Big Ten championship game. We have, obviously, the two best teams in the conference. That's why it's a championship game, right? That's how it works. Um, we got the Purdue Boilermakers at Michigan. The spread is now up to 17 points in favor of Michigan. And, uh, obviously, we have to kick things off with Jacob. Michigan, they had, you know, a notable win last week against another big team squad. So, that kind of propelled them into this championship game. How are you feeling uh, after that notable win? Yeah, I mean, decently notable win. Um, you know, it wasn't, wasn't really too much of a sweat. Um, just clearly the better team last week and can move right on from that. Um, no, but in all seriousness, Stephanie, I, I wasn't planning on victory lapping at all. I was just going to sit here quietly. Just, just sure take it because it took guys over 20 years to win at the horseshoe. I mean, so take you, the you, came out, you came out mm-hmm. on fire just with no analysis, just strictly going against my play. So, I mean, I feel like I feel compelled to victory lap just a little bit and I think Michigan had the perfect game plan last week. I don't think you could have drawn up a better game plan. And they knew in the first half that Ohio State was going to completely load the box and try to shut down their run game. And J.J. McCarthy was ready. He completed those downfield passes when he needed to. They were on fire with their play-action passing game. And then in the second half, that Ohio State defense just got tired. They got tired. They weren't built for a physical game like that. And they couldn't defend the run in the second half. They just fell apart up front. And Donovan Edwards is fantastic. J.J. McCarthy is fantastic. Our defense made so many clutch plays. Mike Sanders still and the rest of the secondary. I mean, I, it was just, just a perfect effort. And, yeah, I mean, I wasn't planning on really victory lapping, but here we are. Um, go Blue. But, anyways, we can move on to the Big Ten Championship where Michigan is 17-point favorites. And I harken back to last year against Iowa. And I think we had a good discussion on the, on this channel about that Iowa versus Michigan game. And, ultimately, it wasn't really close. Um it's a bit of a different matchup just because Purdue is built around their quarterback, Aiden O'Connell, and unfortunate situation with him, with his older brother passing away. I'm not sure if you guys are uh, up to speed on that situation, but he's been away from campus this week. He did start last week in spite of that. And I mean, it, it's a difficult thing to handicap. Um, not really sure how to approach that, but like th- the energy is definitely going to be weird for him. And I mean, it's, it's going to be a tough game for this entire program to try to rally around him, but Ultimately, I just think Purdue's defense isn't good enough. Uh, they rank 127th in allowing explosive runs, 
101st in rushing EPA allowed overall. And Purdue wants to throw the ball with Aiden O'Connell, but they're going to be throwing against an excellent secondary that really shut down CJ Stroud last week. And it's just it's just not a good matchup for Purdue in a lot of ways. And I, I'm fine laying with the number with Michigan. I think there's not going to be any sort of a look ahead or let down or anything like that here. I think they're going to be completely dialed in, just like they were last year for this game. And it's a similar scenario, a bit of a different matchup with Purdue here, but I think they're going to be able to run away with this game. All right, Patrick. Yeah, so if this was a regular season game at Purdue, I would 100% put a half unit on the Purdue money line. Love the spoiler makers as a as a road or as a home dog against a, a top team, but neutral field, Big Ten championship. I don't know if you look at the history of the Big Ten championship game, it's generally a pretty chalky affair. Jacob referenced last year's game. I mean, you can go back through the past, you know past decade, really. The favorites win in this game. They usually win pretty comfortably. And I think the nature of this Michigan team really lends itself to either being upset or, or, blown, or blowing uh, Purdue out here. And I do think they take care of business. This defense should be able to to shut down what Purdue does offensively, especially with what Jacob mentioned. The, just kind of the uncertainty of some of what Purdue has going on with Aiden O'Connell and and, and some of their offensive personnel. And then, honestly, if you do a deeper dive on this Purdue team, they really aren't exceptional at anything offensively. I think really the calling card of their team has been their, their defensive secondary. And I think really that's the last unit that you'd want to have be the calling card going against Michigan here, where I think you'd, you'd rather be good in the trenches. I really don't think being good in the secondary provides you all that much of an advantage. I think this Michigan team can beat you multiple ways. I think they do here. I really think they're going to be able to ball control um, and yeah, I think they're going to be able to hold this offense in check. So I like Michigan with the points here. It is a lot of points, but I think you're getting under a key number in 17 at 16 and a half. And, and yeah, like I said, the history of this game lends itself to, uh, to the favorites. Stephanie. Yeah. I also had a note about O'Connell and I do think, I mean, I will give Michigan all the credit on the road. I almost will even say that there's a lot of value in taking them to win the national championship. The way they prepared for that game I mean, J.J. McCarthy really surprised me. 263 passing yards, three touchdowns. And then Edwards coming in, Blake Corum, you know, wasn't in that spot that we've seen him all season. He comes in over 200 rushing yards, two touchdowns. I mean, Michigan's offense really went off for how good their defense is, and Ohio State didn't do themselves any favors whatsoever. So definitely credit to Harbaugh with how he turned that program around. They are 25-2 and two over the past two seasons. Only one country, or one team in the country has a better record, and that's Georgia. So Michigan is really solid. I've taken them with some big spreads earlier this season. They've done a great job. They have the best point differential in the country, beating teams by an average of 27.2 points. Again, the O'Connell point is you've seen so many amazing stories where teams rally and, and they have an amazing game and they do that for, do it for their loved one. I'm, I'm not willing to bet on, on a game like that for, for Purdue. Um, he did have an, a league high um, for 284 passing yards per game uh, away from practice this week and Michigan just, I mean, they're on a roll and you do wonder how much preparation they took to Ohio state and, you know, how they how they get back on track with the next one. But, I mean, I do think that they're in, in good shape to keep rolling. Um, looking forward to see how they do in the playoff. But, I mean, they are a much, much better team than I ever thought. I've been taking their bigger spreads this season. But after that game, they really pulled out some new cards. And, I mean, J.J. McCarthy outplaying a Heisman candidate in C.J. Stroud. Really, really good spot. So, I'll happily lay the points with Michigan. I think it was a Heisman candidate. At this point, um, you might get an invite still, but <laughs> maybe um, my TCU QB is ranked higher than him now, though. <laughs> I, you know, like I, I agree with all your guys' analysis. I'm definitely not betting Purdue. But I'm actually not that comfortable betting Michigan either. I understand the Big Twelve champ or Big Twelve Big Ten championship has been chalky, like you said, Patrick. And I think it's hard to look at betting trends in football because it's such a limited uh, sample size. I'm not really a go off that. I just think that Michigan's had a few letdown spots. And I know it sounds, you guys mentioned you don't think it's a letdown spot. I, I still kind of do. That was the emotional high of emotional highs last week. They're looking for the playoffs going forward. I don't think they lose this game, but I think this could be an Illinois-esque game. Not as close because Purdue's defense is not the same. So, but I, but I could see this being like a 16, 15 point game at the very end. 
I just don't feel the need to put a unit on it. There's a lot, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot other places I really like. I think Harbaugh spent the last 18 months seemingly, you know, focused the scheme for that Ohio State game because that game plan was one of the most beautiful coaching jobs we've ever seen in college football. Like, and I think that's credit to Ohio State. Like, the team's still a really good team. It was just like it took that great of a game plan to to have a dominant performance on the field. With that said, I don't know how this dude has had any time to scheme for Purdue. I imagine they realize if they go out there and they just play this game, they're going to win, and they're probably going to win by at least two touchdowns. It's kind of like, do they need to win by three touchdowns? Are they going to win by three touchdowns? It's not a game I want to play this weekend when I have a lot of places like the Kansas State game. We mentioned Fresno State, a, a bunch of other places where I'm putting money. So I'm just off it, but don't hate your picks. You got to you gotta put points to units on the spoiler makers money line, man. This All right, I'm going to put point classic two spoiler on, makers right here. <laughs> point two <laughs> units on the plus seven or 600. No, I'll put this a. This is a law. I mean, do you guys think that there's any wiggle room for them if they lose this game or if it's like within three? I I think they're pretty locked in unless no, they completely yeah. blows out um, Kansas State. Are you talking for the playoff? Yeah, oh. like I like what are they? What do they have to lose? I think maybe their seed, but if they fall to three, still the same game. Mich- I feel like Michigan and Georgia are pretty locked in. I think even if Michigan loses this game, they're still a top two seed. Even I agree. I guess I guess, if, I, think there's, there's, I guess undefeated, undefeated TCU. Yeah, undefeated yeah. TCU. Probably. I don't think the committee's going to give TCU the credit though. I think USC is the only team that can lose their seed because they would lose to the same team twice. That's ranked lower. Uh, than the loss that Ohio State took, and yeah. we all know the branding that Ohio State has. Um, well, I mean, I I would not do it. I, I do think UC deserves a spot, even as a Buckeye fan. But I think that uh, the committee might view otherwise. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put exactly point one six five units at plus six hundred to get me Tell exactly me. a one unit payout if somehow Purdue pulls this That's off. That's a nod to me <laughs> for sure. <laughs> all right, it's one units. We got all three of you on Michigan at minus 16 and a half, which you can still get on FanDuel at minus 110. It's moved to 17 on DraftKings, but shop that around. Try and get under 17. It can be a very key number, especially in a, a chalky game like this. And uh, let's move on Imagine to just the last Super game. quick. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. So I just want to – I just I, I just would be remiss if I didn't say thoughts and prayers to Aiden O'Connell and his family. And I mean, I, I feel like I didn't handle talking about that in the best way. I, I went straight into talking about how to handicap it and – I, I just I was sitting here like regretting that and thoughts and prayers to his family and obviously a tragic situation and I mean yeah hopefully hoping for the best with them. Appreciate that, Jacob. And yeah, it's taught like we we've had this a few times on this video where there's a lot of stuff going on in college football right now and it's really hard to just talk about these games without addressing them. We try and talk about what's on the field, but when you're talking about what your predictions are for a game, these players are kids. They're eighteen to twenty two year olds. They're affected by stuff off the field and. We've seen it all over, and uh, I'm with you. Thoughts and prayers to his family. So now, let us move on to the final game. And that game is Clemson against UNC for the ACC championship game. Oh, man. UNC has been letting me down as of recently. Jacob, I've kicked you off on quite a few of these, but I really, I just got to give it to you right now. How, how are you betting UNC at plus seven and a half? I mean, I at this point... I'm a Clemson hater, UNC fan, and I can't even lay lay the points right now. So please convince me. Uh, it's just one. It's just one word. Vibes. That's it. Um, I, I just love Drake May, man. I just, I just do. I think he's a fantastic quarterback, and DJ Uagalele, his confidence is just completely shook. Um, completed 27 percent of his passes last week against this pretty poor South Carolina defense, and like, I understand this UNC defense is bad. I mean, it, they're, they're bad in pretty much every area. Um, 120 20th or worse in success rate, finishing drives, havoc, like across the board, they're just a bad defense, but ultimately you're getting plus seven and a half good value on uh, the home team with the better, the far better quarterback. And yeah, I'm willing to put a little sprinkle on it and just, you know, liven it up a little bit and hope that Drake, Drake may pulls off the upset. But I mean, I, I, I think we've talked about him plenty, but I think he might be the best quarterback in college football right now. And I'm excited to see him up, up for this challenge. I mean, I don't hate it. Like I've said, I, I love Drake May. I totally fine betting on him in a lot of circumstances. And this Clemson team has been, I don't know, it's been a down, downward spiral. And if Debo, Debo, Debo Sweeney, uh, Debo Sweeney continues not to use the transfer portal, 
kind of curious where this program goes. Kind of curious where the ACC goes, you know, to be completely honest. Um, but Stephanie, we'll go over to you. What are your thoughts on this game? I hate to say it, but um, I agree with Jacob. <laughs> I also <laughs> don't love Clemson all season long, and I want it, but I want to take North Carolina. I don't know if I – I'm still kind of stuck on that Miami cover game where – they were 19 and a half point underdogs and they couldn't even keep it within that with Clemson. So I'm still a little bit burned on that game. Um, North Carolina, I mean, looking at the quarterback difference there, uh, Cade Klubnik, he's available, but I mean, well, Sweeney eventually cut the court with DJ Uyangale. I, I don't know. You guys mentioned his confidence. Um, Dabo not loving, you know, he's very loyal, but I mean, North Carolina on the flip side has a great freshman quarterback. You guys mentioned in Drake may he's third in the nation and first in the ACC with 320 passing yards per game. I mean, and he's also got a great target with Josh downs. Uh, also not to mention Clemson's defense allowed 360 passing yards against South Carolina. South Carolina was on a roll after that Tennessee game. So, I mean, yeah, credit to them, but I don't love Clemson in this the, the season at all. I don't know if I'm willing to to take North Carolina to cover, but I do like the over in this one. I don't think either of these secondaries have a prayer. Um, I think it's it's going to be, um, you know, a lot of points on the board. The total is like, I, I get, I'm getting at 63 and a half. Um, but another matchup that is standing out to me a little bit, I think North Carolina's passing offense is the best unit on the field in this one. They're ranked eighth in passing yards per game. They're going up against Clemson's passing defense, which isn't phenomenal. Um, but also on the flip side, uh, North Carolina is outside the top 100 in scoring defense. So Clemson will definitely be able to score in this game, um, whether, whichever quarterback they, they choose to go with. But Either way, I just think that both teams are going to score a lot here. So I like the over. I would, I'm going to root for North Carolina, but I don't know if I can bet on them to cover. All right, so you're, <clears throat> you're on the over. Patrick, you're on Clemson minus seven and a half points. Yeah, this is a offensive-defensive line mismatch me where I think this Clemson defensive line is going to be able to eat against – this North Carolina offensive line. Um, I think North Carolina, they've had a particularly tough time trying to run the ball. As it is, I think it's going to be a little compounded against this Clemson, Clemson run stopping unit, just a defensive line in general, especially on the interior. And I also think they're going to be able to get pressure on Drake May here. Um, and, you know, I'll also eat some crow. I've, I've been critical of this Clemson secondary, especially May Wiggins. I mean, I watched that Wake Forest game and I thought, I mean, he looked like one of the worst. You know, one of the worst corners in the NFL, or not the NFL, in college football uh, after that game. But they've really come around as a unit. They actually haven't graded too too horribly over the past few weeks. So I I, I am on, on Clemson here. I think their defense, especially their defensive line, is a bit of a mismatch. And I think that, that'll be enough to, to cover in this spot. See, you guys all brought up parts of this game on, on why it's a no bet for me. Like, Clemson's defensive line... Um, is a big part of that. But the fact that it's at seven and a half points in Clemson, and it's like what they do at quarterback, it's, it's so many points to lay with an offense that, yeah, they should be able to still score and run the football in UNC, but it's like how efficient is that offense going to be? For me, the reason why it's a no bet and why I was kind of surprised, Jacob, that you're willing to go with it, but I, I do love the call on just vibes, is I'm going to say, I think UNC's offense lost them the game last week. Like, I, I literally said in the video, there's no way that that's the case. And uh, I should have said there's probably no way that that's the case. Because watching that game, it wasn't Drake May's fault. Though I do think he could have played better. He had quite a few drops towards the end of that game. And that's there's nothing you can do about that. But you're not betting just on Drake May. You have to bet on this football team. Unless you're in certain states that you can bet on player props. We won't get into that. But if you're betting on this UNC team, you're betting on it as a whole. And like... The run game wasn't very efficient, which I'll give credit to NC State. It's a great run-stopping unit. They weren't catching passes. They weren't making big plays. Like, Drake May can only do so much. And I I got overzealous last week, and that's why I'm just not going to play it this week is because I feel like I learned my lesson. It's like quarterbacks definitely matter, and they're the obviously the most important position, but they seriously can only do much, and that's what I'm scared about in this matchup. So that's where I'm at. Yeah, I think there's a very sound uh, analytical argument for Clemson in this game, and I think that's probably the sharp side. But honestly, you're getting points with the better quarterback at home in the ACC championship, and 
I just think the energy around this North Carolina team is better right now. And yeah, yeah I'll take a, I'll take a half unit stab at it. Well, I think I will... it's that it's that hook at seven and a half that just like uh, it makes it so I, I can't understand the argument of just going with them. But again, Patrick, I think your sound analytical sharp argument definitely scares me away from from playing it or anything like that. So the final picks here we got Clemson minus seven and a half. North or uh, for Patrick at a half unit, UNC plus seven and a half, half unit for Jacob, and then over 63 for Stephanie. And that's going to wrap things up. No betting report card. We're going to do a whole video where we go over the betting report card for the whole season. And we want to say thank you guys for watching. As always, if you like this video, drop a like. If you did not, a dislike. Comment down below your favorite bets. Hit the subscribe button to see more content like this. And we will see you for all of the bowl games very soon.